Okay, good. Uh, my name is Francis Langlois. I'm going to talk about the content landscape. In contrast to uh, the question about content types earlier, this, broadly speaking, is content like documentation. This is the plug fest, in case you're still wondering. Um, I'm from the East Coast originally, and I've worked in software since 1987, doing support, documentation, training, that sort of thing. I've worked at uh, three startups before I came to Microsoft, and I've worked in lots of different roles at Microsoft, or I should say uh, different types of employment, first as a contractor, and then as a vendor, and um, then became a Blue Badge, which is a full-time employee in 1998, and I also play the tuba in the Microsoft Orchestra. Yes, we have an orchestra. So what I'm going to talk about and what I hope to do in this session is present the basics and how open specifications fit together, um, give you a broader context of how documentation ties together, give you places where you can find documentation if you haven't found that already, and show how the different disciplines of development, testing, support, and documentation come together. So what are open specifications? These are documents that we create that provide a high level of transparency to our technology and platforms. So we want these to, to be um, usable by third parties to create and extend our platform and do so in a trustworthy and reliable way. So this is good for us, this is good for you, and, and that's the main reason we do this. And also, um, this already happened today. Some people will call the open specifications protocol docs. Some will call them technical documents, normative content and specs. These are all synonyms for the same thing. So to put that into context, you know, people will go back and forth with this language. And it can sometimes be confusing. But if, um, if I'm confusing, just let me know, and I'll square that up. How, how is this kind of documentation different from other documentation at Microsoft? Well, for one, well, essentially, the form and the style is what's different. The normative language is, is a kind of language that's driven by the normative concept that you find um, in international standards and in law and philosophy. Um, the, the, the style and the guidance that we develop here at Microsoft is developed across product teams. So we have Windows, we have SQL, we have Exchange, we have Office and SharePoint, all contributing to des designing what the normative content and what these specs will look like. And then we persistently apply that to the documentation so that it's consistent from document to document. So um, E. Ray talked about SV Beppo this morning, and that's an overview type of document. And we apply a certain kind of style and guidance to overview documents. And then in the case of um, MS List WS or some of the stuff that um, Maxime talked about, that's a very specific SOAP protocol, and that's a different kind of document. Also, if you have any questions at any time, just raise your hand, and I'll take them. So PlugFest, for the most part, is about open specifications. Now, this particular one is about SharePoint front-end protocols. But there have been other ones as well about Exchange RPC protocol, as you can see in the list, and binary file formats. Um, and and the, the, the form of, the, of the, the sessions are similar, but the documents are quite different. So the other thing is to address this point of content. What is content? In, in our case, or when I'm talking up here, content is anything we publish at Microsoft. So it can be reference documentation, IntelliSense that you see in Visual Studio as you're using it, um, samples, any kind of code like that, help for the individual products at the user level, videos, which are becoming more and more uh, common, any blog content, that's also content, and social media. Also, one of the big challenges we have right now is integrating our own self-produced content with content that's produced by third parties and out there in the world. So I'm a content publisher at Microsoft, and that's a role that not all companies have. Because Microsoft is a, a large company, 
We have a lot of documentation. We have a de dedicated role for that. That allows developers to develop, testers to test, and us to cre create the content or a help with creating the content so that is consistent and usable, um, broadly speaking. Interoperability content is a very specific type of content, these open specifications, that differs from most of our other content, particularly in the form and the style. Um, just to give you an idea, uh, Office, SharePoint, and Link have 36,000 pages of open specifications, and Exchange has 8,000 pages of open specifications, which is my way of justifying the fact that we have this content publisher role at Microsoft. If you look at the content we produce, this is a, uh, people have asked me, what is this slide trying to tell us? Well, this, I'm gonna do my best to, to explain that. Open specifications are the most complex or the lowest level content that we produce. It's very specific, it's virtually impossible for a content publisher to discern what's, how to create the binary file format for a given uh, client. Um, SDK and reference material is a little bit easier to do because you're a user of that technology as a content publisher as well. So this, this slide basically encapsulates that the open specifications are the lowest level content and as you go, go out, it's a higher level. So there's help at the end user level for, for products like Office and that has a very big audience. So that's the other thing that distinguishes this, this type of content. The open specifications content is a very narrow audience. You can also think of it as at the center is the developer, at the outer ring is the end user, and there's variance in here. For instance, in the case of object models like VBA or some of the um, programming languages on things like Outlook, you'll have some end users wait in there, and then some developers developing third-party applications at that level as well. I feel like I'm talking fast, so I'm going to take a breath here. Okay, here's the um, life cycle of an open specification. Essentially, once something is targeted or identified that we need an open specification, we determine what technology is at the heart of it. And that determines what template we will use to create the doc. Then the content is created. This varies from team to team, but in Office and SharePoint, the initial content is created by the developer team. It could be a PM, it could be a developer, it could be somebody on the technical side. Then at the third level, content is made standard. So that's the role that our team plays for the most part. We apply a kind of um, guidance and standardization to the content so that from document to document, you can expect the same thing. Testing is built on the document so that we can verify that what's in the document is true. So that is a kind of a verification test. Later, the document is published on MSDN, and if any issues are found, both in testing or in, in, in general usage, they're addressed. Sometimes the issues are documentation issues, that is, we've put in the wrong information. Sometimes through the testing, we determine that the, the, the property is returning a different value than we expected. So there's two different types of um, issues that we would want to address. And essentially, the last three um, uh, steps repeat. So central to developing the, the uh, content is a template. And templates differ from uh, technology to technology. So the binary file format is different than SOAP, which is different than RPC. Within a given vertical uh, type of template, it's consistent across it. So a Windows SOAP template versus an Office SOAP document is similar in structure. Also, in all of the um, product units, the, the way that the material is presented is driven by the concept of normative language, which I'll, I'll show you in a bit. So this particular uh, plug fest is mainly about SOAP protocols. Here you'll see that there's a number of different templates that we use, and they are derived from a simple template called the block template. Also, this, this talk won't go into um, a lot of deep stuff like Maxime's did, so you can kind of let your brain relax a little bit, I think. So there have been other plug fests where we talked about the binary file format, and those were um, the, 
the one in the middle here. So when we start off, the templates look something like this, and this is taken from guidance that we have internally in the company that helps us to keep the documents consistent. So in the center is the block template, and on either side are two of the more common template types that you'll see. They always start with an introduction, and then section two, which is where the normative content begins, you'll see they differ. In the case of SOAP, Basically, the, you can think of the, the unit of currency in a SOAP template as messages passed back and forth from client to server. In a binary file format, it's structures talking about the various individual bytes that are in a binary file format. So as you go down, um, you, they differ a little, but broadly speaking, they all have these similar things, the similar structure. And, and rather than talking about this in the abstract, I'm going to make this a little bit more concrete, too. We're talking about a SOAP template when we talk about the MS List WS protocol. I should also point out that that's the short name, and oftentimes we'll use that name as a shorthand. And it's not terribly informative, but it makes talking about it a little bit easier. Um, and before, this is sort of like giving you the answer to the test. It's a part of the SharePoint front-end protocols. So if you were to put this MS list WS into Bing or your favorite share, uh, search tool, you would come up with essentially the two hits here. I don't know if this, yeah, right here. And if you were to look in section one, you'd see this introduction, which is this document specifies the list web service protocol that is used for the manipulation of lists and schemas and list data, list schemas and list data. So. The reason I put the SharePoint front-end protocols is that's not evident in the introduction, but that's the style of the document. So if you were to search for this in Bing, you would find this information out on, um, from MSDN. And this isn't, this is a, uh, I know the question came up earlier during E-Ray's talk about what's the broad picture of how the documents fit together. This kind of uh, gives you a sense for that. At the, at the top, you'll see the open specifications. And as you go down further, you'll see protocols. And you'll see that the different product units each have their own entry. So Windows protocols, Microsoft Office protocols, and SharePoint products and technologies protocols. The list goes on for, I think, three or four more items. Within that, you'll see the SharePoint products and technologies protocols. And also this node here that says overview. Overview is where the overview documents live. They are a specific type of template that try to encapsulate what are the related protocols for a given area. And specifically, the SharePoint front end protocols, each of the overviews has an entry in the table of contents here. So I'm going to jump out to MSDN and show how this fits together a little bit better. But let me uh, get to my next slide first. So what is normative language? In simplest terms, kind of dev, dev talk, normative stuff is required, informative stuff is nice to have. So a specification will contain information that you must implement, and that's one of the key words, must. As well, you'll have a, um, information useful to understand how that implementation works, and that's in an informative section. So section two always contains normative data. Here are the sort of special normative words. Each of these, and this is the de definition that we have that we use as guidance. I should also add, I kind of minimize the list a bit because some of these are, are crazy, like may not. It's like angels dancing on the head of a pin, what that really means. But um, for the purposes of this, to keep it simple, may means an item is optional, should, strongly recommended, must, required must not, could break something, okay? Any questions there? Here's a specific example of a complex type, and if you look, it's from section two, and it's from the MS List WS protocol, and it's the list definition CT for complex type, strict type coercion. Um, true if expressions anywhere in the list that include invalid typecasts, 
such as casting a date to a string should return an error instead of attempting to perform a cast. Now, I'd also point out this is a bit of a special case that required a footnote. And that also is a, when, when something differs from our specification in one of our own implementations, usually because things vary from version to version, a footnote is required. I know it's pedantic, it's, it's, uh, but that's how it works. Any questions there? So where do you find this content? Well, Bing, your favorite share or search tool. Um, we have an open specifications development center and that contains on it a link to MSDN. I'm going to um, attempt to address the question that came up earlier about ways to see relations to our um, various different types of protocols. So if you go out to the Open Specifications Developer Center, you'll learn about specifications and interoperability. This Learn tab has content on it that is not normative, it's more informative, and talks about the way in which you can use the open specifications to move towards solving your problems. Um, we also, well, I'm gonna come back to this after I show this. If you go to the library and you look at the uh, normal, what I consider the normal view, which is the old fashioned view, classic. We could, oh, great, that's not good. Let's try something else. Oh, this is good, good. Thank you for rescuing me. Um, we go down to the open specifications, and so I'm just navigating down the list, just as I showed earlier in my pre-baked cake. Um, we'll go into SharePoint protocols, technology, whoops. Protocol documents, SharePoint front end. This mouse is on a delay, it feels like. Okay, and if we were to go down, there's a lot of front end protocols. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a daunting um, area. And here's lists. And again, we can go down into section one and we'll see our introduction which I hope matches the one I already put in the slides. Okay, there we go. So that's one way of looking at how the documents are organized. If we go up to, I'm gonna go back to my slides here. We've also created this open specifications pivot, which is a way of organizing the documents. Now, this is um, our first foray into this area. So we're still looking for a lot of feedback on this. There's a feedback button down here. But what this allows you to do is to narrow the focus and start to see how various protocols are related. Um, I'm just going to short circuit this and go right down to lists because this is fairly new to me still. This was just launched this week, right? Correct, this was just launched this week um, by the hardworking folks in content publishing. Um, here's lists, and if you go here, you can zoom in, and this is another way of getting at the same kind of information. And you'll see a, a, a uh, tab over here that highlights related protocols. We'll take your feedback on this here, but also um, we'll have a fee feedback form at the end of the, the session. So, thank you. I'll make sure to pass it on to the guy who did it. <laughs> A lot of pain has been spent on all the documents that I have. Well, I'm, I'm happy that this is helping. So this is one other thing I want to address. We've had a lot of, um, I should say for the people in the other room, we just got a compliment on the uh, open specifications pivot and MSDN. Okay, so vertical document versus horizontal customer scenario. So we've done a lot of these kinds of um, uh, plug fests and dev labs and, and this kind of thing. We consistently get this, this feedback, and I just want to make sure this is still true. The developer gets, identifies a need or an opportunity, or his manager tells him about a need or an opportunity, and I'll say he, doesn't have to be he, searches for similar scenarios. If lucky, he finds one. If not lucky, he begins to build a knowledge base. 
using specific material that he finds. He implements, then searches, uses social media for additional clarification. Um, any and all content is considered. Nothing is off limits. Microsoft content may differ in that there's a higher confidence factor around Microsoft content. But all content has to prove its utility in code. All content is subject to does it work scrutiny. Is this not true for anybody here? Is this pretty much the case? I'm going to go with the blank looks as yes. OK, we understand that. That works. The other feedback we got from people is, yes, scenarios are great. And when we find a scenario that you've documented, it's, it's awesome. Or anyone is documented, really. Um, but there's no expectation that every scenario is going to be nailed. And we get that, too. So we're not trying to change how you approach doing your work. We want to just show how the open specifications are conceived. And maybe this allows you to expand your search when you land on one thing in uh, using Bing or Google. We also want to present this as a complementary approach to what you already do. So people have their way of doing things. That's fine. It works. This is an another way to expand beyond that. So here is, these are my goals. And I think I've covered everything uh, except for testing and support, which I don't want to shortchange. Uh, we have people in the room who are anxious to help you uh, from support. We have Tom Jebo and Josh Curry. And when you, not, not quite correct, please correct me. Uh, Tom Jebo is not here, but uh, Sebastian is going to OK, Sebastian and Josh. OK. And if you have any uh, open issues, we'll start a support log. We can do that here. Um, and any of these, any and all support logs are, are, are available to us in content publishing. We search through them. We try to analyze the data that's coming back and identify opportunities where we can provide additional clarification. Um, we also do that with the forums. And the last but not least thing to address is testing. We have a lot of people from the testing discipline in the room. And there are additional presentations later in the week about how you can use the testing resources that we have. And if you want to know more about how we verify that the documents are giving good data, we can talk about that as well. Hector Sandino is in the back. You can talk to him on that. And Michael Bowman is up here. So as I said, that's the end of my talk. Um, we have a survey to give out. You can give us any feedback that you have on our content or anything, really. Um, and Michael was going to lead a talk or lead any kind of open questioning about what you would like to see or what do you see as your own content challenges as well. And just put the capstone on that. Um, you can talk to me. I'll be here for today and tomorrow or any of the other UA people in the room. There's some back there, Leith McCombs and Lola Jacobson and Jeffrey Gilbert in the back. So uh, thank you very much. Any questions? Yes. Um, in the case of the open specifications, yeah, we, we, the question is, how do I, how does somebody get updated about changes to the open specification documents? So the update schedule, really. and so right now, what we try to do is post uh, on the support forums when. Sorry. Uh, to, to, we try to provide updates uh, to people or let people know that there's updates to the documentation to the support forms, um, as well as I also blog about uh, which documents have been updated. We typically update on a quarterly schedule, um, and then we'll list just the documents that were updated and things like that. But if you have any questions, you also can contact us directly. So, so, so that brings up a really good question, because uh, a lot of things the the um, open specifications themselves have extensive change tracking that are created by this very diffing thing that you're talking about and that table is in the front of every document so if you think that there's you, you can check a given protocol again vertically we understand that but you can check for any change there. The change tracking is, is very specific with open specifications.
it, it, granted, it's a daunting task to, to, to look through every doc and say, gee, I wonder what changed. Um, that's not easy. But if you're focused on a specific thing, you can see in a given protocol what has changed. And we don't, we don't go to that level of detail on the support form or the blog. Um, but it's, it's something we can look into to figure out a way to better communicate that kind of information. I would also add, for the most part, since most of the specifications have been produced, a lot of work went into making sure that they were correct. Most of the changes are not huge. They're fixes in a lot of cases, issues that were found. But the, because the, the protocol is follow, or the document itself follows the binary specification, there's a limited amount of bytes. It's 2,000 pages of document in the case of Office, but it, it's not going to suddenly become 2,500. It's pretty static once it's published. You look skeptical. Right, and that is in there, but it's it's it is a lot. I, I'll grant you that. So in this case, I'm looking at MS List OUS. The change tracking section is section eight. It will be that way for every SOAP document. This one has not changed since it was initially published. Um, I'll just pick another random one from this morning. Well, thank you for clarifying that. It's up here someplace. Yes, I'm not actually sure where that section is. It's actually in the, the report, actually, if you open up the top, there's this list of services that are about what you're looking for, which will show the, show the changes. Yeah. On the page, scroll down. The scroll down. Yep, the thank you. Yeah. Yep, that's it. So it'll show, it'll show the history, but it won't show as specifics, and if you don't have the previous version, you know. Okay. That's good input. Thank you. Yeah, It, this, just to offer one last comment. So when you see something like no changes to the meaning language or formatting of the technical content, what this means is we identified a value that was wrong and we fixed it. It didn't really change anything material. Or we may, may have even just changed language. We were missing a comma. So it's, it's not a, that's what that indicates. Anything else? Do you want to talk about lunch? Can we come back at uh, 1.15? Thank you very much.